by Chief Kisa Sousa, U.S. Navy from Naval Information Warfare Pacific. So proud that we held as the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the rampers we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rock is regular the palms bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. At this time, please join me in welcoming to the stage Vice Admiral Peter Daly, U.S. Navy retired, Chief Executive Officer and Publisher of the U.S. Naval Institute. Good morning. Let's give our Honor Guard and Chief Souza a quick hand for that. So good morning, I'm Pete Daly, CEO of Publisher, Naval Institute, and on behalf of the Naval Institute and FCA International, we welcome all of you to West 2020. Our conference theme is, are we ready to confront great power competition? And the subtext could easily be restated as, do we have strategy, resources, and execution properly aligned? This is such an important moment to bring the leaders of the sea services, the thought leaders, other senior uniform leaders, corporate, and many of our retired community together to look at the issues that face us today. The town hall discussion with the service chiefs is always one of the highlights, and I can't think of a better place to start than right here. And we're, we're pleased to have the support of Lockheed Martin as our sponsor for this keynote event. And I would like to now call Jim Sheridan from Lockheed Martin up to the stage to say just a few words before we kick off.
Well, good morning. And thank you, Admiral Daly. And I have to agree with you. What a great rendition of our national anthem. That was a great job. I think another round of applause for Chief Sousa is in, in order. So I'm honored to represent Lockheed Martin at FCA and the U.S. Naval Institute's West 2020 Conference. I'm always impressed uh, with the conference agenda and its ability to attract the highest level of speakers from across the armed forces and the steady growth in our attendance, as you can look around and see in this room. I have to say that all the defense industry trade show events I attend, this town hall is the event that I look forward to the most. Hearing directly from the Sea Service Chiefs helps attendees understand and respond to pressing needs across the Sea Services. As Pete mentioned, this year's theme is, Are We Ready to Confront Great Power Competition? The theme is incredibly relevant and aligns with the National Defense Strategy and the recently released FY21 budget request. As the adversaries work to erode the technological, technological advantage of the United States, our sailors, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen must be prepared with next generation capabilities that address these evolving threats. At Lockheed Martin, our employees use the phrase, your mission is ours, to describe the why behind what it is we do. It reminds us that our customers' missions come first. Knowing the work we do plays a role in supporting Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard missions is a tremendous motivation and point of pride for each and every one of our employees. So on behalf of Lockheed Martin, thank you all for attending today's town hall and a special thanks to Admiral Schultz, General Berger, Admiral Gilday, and Secretary Work for spending their precious time today to share their perspectives and insights with us. Thank you very much. So thank you, Jim. Thank you, Lockheed Martin. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce the moderator for the town hall discussion, Secretary Bob Work. Secretary Work served as the 32nd Deputy Secretary of Defense for three different SecDefs across two administrations. Previously, he served as CEO for the Center for New American Security, and from 2009 to 2013, he served as Undersecretary of the Navy. Mr. Work is currently back at CNAS as a distinguished senior fellow He's also a counselor at the Telemus Group, a senior fellow at Johns Hopkins APL, and a distinguished visiting fellow at MITRE Corporation. He served 27 years on active duty as a Marine officer across a wide range of positions, including command of an artillery battery and an artillery battalion. We at the Naval Institute are very proud that he is currently the chair of our board of directors. So let's give a warm welcome as I invite Secretary Bob Work, Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Dave Berger, Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Mike Gilday, and Commandant of the Coast Guard, Admiral Carl Schultz, to the stage. Thank you for that kind introduction, uh, Pete, and good morning, everyone, to the kickoff session of the 30th Annual West Conference. Um, we're blessed to have all three of the top leaders of our sea services here today. This is unusual. It's harder to get all three of their schedules aligned than it is to get three carrier strike groups aligned. But uh, we have from my right, your left, Commandant Schultz, Commandant of the Coast Guard. He's been in his job longer than any of the three senior leaders, uh, becoming the 26th Commandant of the Coast Guard in June 1st, 2018. And you take a look at his career, and I'm not an expert at all 
in uh, Coast Guard careers, but as you read it, you say, okay, I get it. This is a Coast Guardsman through and through. Um, he commanded a 110-foot island-class patrol boat, a 180-foot seagoing buoy tender, a 270-foot famous class, medium-class uh, cutter. He was in charge of the 11th District, which encompasses all of California. Uh, he was in charge of the Coast Guard sector in Miami and was the commander of the Coast Guard Atlantic area, which also was dual-hatted as Coast Guard Defense Force East. Also was the director of Ops, J3, down at the U.S. Southern Command. So I'd like you to all join me in welcoming a distinguished Coast Guardsman and 26th Commandant of the Coast Guard. Admiral Mike Gilday became the 32nd CNO uh, back in August of 2019. U.S. Naval Academy graduate as a SWO. And if you, again, you take a look at his career as a SWO, and it's quite remarkable. He served on the Chandler, which was a kid-class destroyer, uh, the USS Princeton, which was a Tyco. He commanded two destroyers, the Higgins and the Benfold, a Flight 1, Flight 2, um, Arleigh Burke, commander of Destroyer Squadron 7, and commander of CSG-8, the Truman uh, Carrier Strike Group. So if you're a SWO daddy, I mean, this is a pretty good career progression. He was also the 10th Fleet and Fleet Cyber Command and was the director of the Joint Staff when he was picked to be the 32nd Chief of Naval Operations. Thank you for being here, Mike. Thank you. Please. Thank you. The General Dave Berger is 38th Commandant of the Marine Corps, and he was, uh, assumed his job within about a month of Admiral Gilday on July 11, 2019. He's an infantryman, and just like our other two panelists, you take a look at his career and say, okay, this is a Marine through and through. Commanded Recon Company, 3rd Battalion, 8th Marines, Regimental Combat Team 8 in Fallujah, 1st Marine Division forward in Afghanistan, he was in charge of the MAGTAF Training Command at 29 Palms, commanded the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force, Fleet Marine Forces Pacific, and was the commanding general of the Marine Corps Combat Development Command when he was picked as the commandant. Um, hoorah, pretty, pretty serious. You know, I'm, I'm a Marine too, so uh, not as good as a Marine as a commandant. <laughs> but thank you for being here. And we're going to spend about 40 minutes talking among ourselves, and then we'll turn it over to questions in the audience. I'm going to break it down roughly one-third, one-third, one-third in terms of readiness, capabilities, and personnel. So I'm going to start off with readiness, which I know is a key theme on everyone here. And I want to start with a topical issue of the day, the coronavirus. And uh, as you're answering, I'll use my, uh, since I shake, shook all your hands, I'm going to take the opportunity, and I'll pass this around. <laughs> but uh, has the pandemic affected fleet operations and training in any material way? I noted that uh, PAC Fleet has said there's going to be a 14-day uh, delay between any port calls. I know some exercises have been uh, canceled, but I don't know how many. So I just wanted to start off, if you could give the audience just a real quick kind of overview on do you see it having an impact yet? So why don't we start with the Commandant and come this way. Sure, I'll, I'll tell you this, um, Secretary. First off, for the Coast Guard, our, our people and interfacing on the waterfront and the regulated maritime community, this is a significant issue. You know, sitting in DHS, this is one of those places where you say, why wouldn't you have the fifth armed service and now five of six armed services, maybe in DOD. This is one of those places where it makes perfect sense. You know, we do the arrivals of passengers in the United States. CBP, Customs Border Protection, looks at cargo. So we're intimately involved. About 4,000 ships a month call on the United States, about 750 here on the Pacific. We're screening every one of those ships. So ships that are coming out of China, other than Hong Kong and Macau, you know, if they're coming in on, you know, 14 days or less at sea, we are keenly scrubbing those lists of crew. We want to make sure who's on board. 
passenger vessels that have less than 14 days during that incubation period are being detained at sea. Uh, cargo operations, we're working with shippers, we're working with, if there's a crew member that's identified, you know, we're working with CDC and other local health officials to be on top of that. You know, walking it back into the force, you know, personal protective uh, equipment for our folks, policy, we're starting to get into that realm here as it's becoming an increasingly uh, evolving domestic situation, you know, policies in terms of folks on leave, you know, people got spring break coming up where they want to travel. I think we're deeply involved with this and being in DHS, this is one of those places where our regulatory roles, I think, sit outside the Department of Defense, but they're a, they're a good fit in, in DHS and we partner, you know, outside of a crisis, we work in this this, this theme with Homeland Security, with Health and Human Services, with FEMA on a, re, you know, a persistent basis. So I think when an episode, episodic situation like this comes up, we're ready to, to press in on that. So you know, any impact on training or readiness yet? Not significant. Uh, so our connections really from the services are up through the department and then uh, the CDC and, uh, and the World Health Organization. So uh, we're executing through the combatant commanders and of course, in the United States for the U.S. Northern Command. Uh, uh, the coronavirus manifests, manifests itself in different ways depending upon the location. And so what we're seeing across the combatant commands uh, is a variety of steps that they're taking, some uh, more pronounced than others depending upon the location of concentration areas of the virus. So for example, uh, for Sixth Fleet out of Naples, We've uh, prohibited travel up in northern Italy due to the concentration of the outbreak there. Same thing in, in certain spots in Asia. Um, we are, uh, we've trained our medical personnel to be able to identify the symptoms and then test and then isolate quarantine until we confirm whether or not it's an active case. Um, we have uh, taken a look at port visits and again, based on those regional estimates, made decisions about canceling port visits, uh, scaling back exercises. Um, we have, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, Pacific Command uh, specifically. And so with respect to port visits, we are testing crews before they go ashore, testing crews before they come back, putting out guidance on, uh, with respect to liberty in terms of where they go, how long they can be out. So we're trying to, you know, at this point, um, uh, obviously we have not contained the virus uh, from the continental United States. And so we're trying to mitigate as best we can, given what we know. But at this point, there are no sailors who have uh, contracted, contracted no, the disease? Not at this point. Okay. Coming up? Uh, probably two points. First, a great job by, you have to help me here, but Miramar up the road, Lackland, yep. Travis. Do you remember the, what the other ones were? Hawaii, Hawaii. Uh, Joint Base uh, Pearl. Going to Nebraska. Uh, Department of Defense was asked, hey, can you house American citizens or other uh, folks coming back and, and uh, would be under quarantine. I mean, really quickly, the base commanders, this is where 06 commanders, you know, make their money because mm -hmm. uh, it's not going to get solved from Washington, D.C., but the base commanders just knocked it out of the park. Quickly uh, made all the arrangements, work really closely with the interagency on quarantine measures and all that sort of thing. I didn't hear, I don't know about y'all, but I didn't hear one hiccup in all that. I'm sure there were. But that's a tribute to the quality of the base commanders. Outside, I think the biggest impact so far has been on the command post exercise in Korea, which uh, had to be uh, tailored way back because of the, the spread of the disease. Does that impact readiness? I think that's a great question for General Abrams. You know, he, would, he would be the best judge of that. But for us, on, um, trim down that, but on the other hand, like Cobra Gold exercise that went in Thailand, we went full up in there. So, like he said, Admiral Davidson's published really good guidance, as has the European Command Commander, Southcom Commander, they've all published really detailed guidance. So, so far, not a big impact. Great, and no Marines have uh, no. been affected, and no Coast Guardsmen or no, women. All right, um, in my view, I was in the uh, department as a senior political official for four of the five, what I'll call the BCA years, the BCA sequestration years. And in my view, the way you have to look at this is during these five years, we had more force structure than the budget we were allocated. In other words, we knew it. We uh, made a conscious decision not to cut force structure. It was a hard decision uh, because the force structure was too big for the budget we had. At the same time, the force structure was too small for what it was being asked to do. 
original thinking in the 50, in the 60, in the 90s, excuse me, was if you got into the first war, you would start to pare back on presence operations around the world so that you could maintain readiness for the second major combat operation or major theater war or however, whatever you wanted to call. But we didn't pare back. And then I don't know, I mean, I remember the term reset and reconstitution. After we left Afghanistan or stopped combat operations, we were supposed to take time to reset the force, which we knew if you have, you know, too much force structure for the budget you have, and it's not big enough for what it's being asked to do, the place where it impacts is readiness. You really start to pare away readiness rapidly. So what I want to ask all three of you is somewhere between 2015 and 2017, we kind of hit rock bottom in terms of the readiness impacts of sequestration in the BCA. And let's set that as a relative score of zero. That was just the kind of low point. We've now seen several years of more budget. Where would you rate the overall readiness of your respective services now against the low point of the BCA years? Come up. Uh, two aspects inside that, like you, you're well aware, sir. One is the amount and one is the when you get the funding. Because if you get a continuing resolution, it just compounds the problem. Because we can't, the commanders don't have the funds. They don't know how much they have to operate with. So that, I, I just want to amplify, as much as the mount matters, and it does, timing, the unpredictability is huge on the force and, uh, and on industry. I think for us, on a scale, what are you asking, like zero One to, to ten. ten, kind of? If we were at a zero, I would say we're at a six or a seven, probably now. That's cool. We don't have the big capital you know, assets like, uh, like uh, Admiral Gilday does. So ours is training and manpower. You can rebound faster than you can uh, deferred maintenance or something like that on a big capital asset. We're not, Marines are never going to be happy, but I would put us probably at a six or a seven. That's not bad. Well, no. That's a pretty good uh, improvement uh, in a relatively short period of time. And to amplify what the Commandant is saying, we were in a continuing resolution about 30% of the time in the BCA years. So in effect, we had an eight month fiscal year, which as the Commandant said, uh, plays hell on trying to do any type of planning. So you know, how's it looking? Yeah, I'd give us a five or a six, uh, but I wanna provide a little bit of context to that. So in terms of budget stability, if you take a look at the last decade, we've had uh, continuing resolutions uh, for about, on average, 130, 35 days a year. So that's about 40% of the year. So there's a lot of instability, a lot of instability there, right, in terms of maintenance and modernization, in particular work that you want to get done, as well as new contracts that you want to start. Hundreds of thousands of contracts that you can't start on time. So if I uh, if I'd back up just a little bit uh, and give you some examples about how we use the force in the period of let's say 2007 and 2014. Uh, we, uh, at that time, I think we did uh, eight double pump uh, carrier strike group deployments. At, at one point, the Ike had gone out and deployed four times with only one maintenance availability between those deployments. So that, coupled with a significant reduction in, uh, um, uh, in, in, uh, in the workforce at our, at our shipyards, we've increased in several, over several years 10,000 workers back in order to handle a workload. You know, at times we were running 500 days behind on submarine maintenance, as an example. And so you had this very high up tempo, right? At the same time, you're trying to catch up under a compressed uh, budget, uh, budget scenario. So what we're doing now is we're essentially holding the line and we're saying, look, across those readiness pillars, you know, whether it's manpower that we're buying back or whether it's modernization that we're now paying for, maintenance that we're now paying for that's been deferred for a long time, uh, stocks in the supply shelves that we're, that we're investing in, um, training, training where we're going up live virtual construct. And so we've essentially said, look, we are going to make sure that, that that stuff is fully funded. And what sacrificed, of course, is the slope of the line in terms of buying uh, capacity, which is, which is new ships. But based on the budget that we have today, you know, if, if I project that out, for a while, and I assumed no growth, and we really haven't had 
growth over the past decade has been constant. We can really afford a Navy of between 305 and 310 ships. Right now we're at 295. And so if you want a, if, if you want a fleet that's going to be ready, capable, and lethal, you've got to make those investments rather than a bigger fleet that's less ready, less capable, less lethal. So a long answer to your question, but we are still feeling the ramifications of op tempo, um, of uh, challenges that we've had in shipyards with respect to a workforce. And that maintenance piece is really the, the key piece in terms of capital ships, in terms of getting them uh, out, and, out and ready to go. Thank you. Coming up. Yeah, let me start, I think we're, the nation's Coast Guard should be, would be about 5% annual operation support growth in approaching a $2 billion major acquisitions capital account. That's, that's what it takes to have a healthy Coast Guard. If I, if I answer your question about the score, I would put us probably at the three or four level. But there's some encouraging news here coming out of the 20 cycle and it's going into the 21 budget cycle. We, since the Budget Control Act of 2011, you know, we've lost 10% purchasing power. And unlike our DOD brethren here, when National Security Presidential Memorandum Number 1 came out and, and sort of addressed this readiness and gave a booster shot in 2018 of about 12%, we weren't part of that conversation. And we're a capital-intensive organization. We've got the same people challenges in a competitive environment. So I would say we've lost that 10%. 20 budget gave us about 4 4.5% positive growth. 21, the budget's presidential submission builds on that. I'm encouraged. My number one um, priority, Bob, coming in the job has been really big R readiness. I talk readiness every single day. It's incumbent on me to take that narrative to the Hill, to take it to the Department of Homeland Security, take it across the river as we support the combatant commanders. So I, I'm encouraged. I think we've got to continue to beat that drum. Um, we're a workforce where, you know, 40% of our enlisted men and women went to 20 years yesteryear before blended retirement system, 60% of our officers. So just getting folks to the gates in our training center in Cape May and then retaining them. We're, you know, we're an apprentice journeyman subject matter expert organization on the technical side as the waterfront's increasingly sophisticated or regulatory stuff. If we don't keep folks in and beyond 12 years, I gotta tell you, it's gonna be a very different Coast Guard. So I, I'm encouraged, I think we're on a good trajectory. We've gotta do some real upgrades on things like our, um, our innovative capabilities, putting mobility in people's hands, our C5I backbone, just on, on the stuff we do to enable day-to-day -day Coast Guard operations. we got some real opportunities, but I think we're starting to have the right conversations. So if we could get on a trajectory, building on that 4.5%, 5% growth, and project that forward, I think we can you know, deliver the Coast Guard the nation needs here to, to support the Homeland Security Department and support our combatant commander colleagues there. Thank you. I, just, I think you all know this. I think the Trump bump, the big increase in defense spending that occurred starting in 17 and went through 20. Essentially what it tried to do was better balance personnel, operations and maintenance, and modernization for the force structure we have. And we were very clear, Secretary Mattis especially so, that this doesn't grow the, appreci appreciably grow the force. It puts it in better balance. We can buy munitions. We can put more money into facilities maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to grow the force, you need 3 to 5 percent real growth year over year for a sustained period of time. So the reason why I wanted to start with this question, and I thought the answer is 3 to 7, a lot of people would say, oh my gosh, you know, this doesn't sound too good. To me, it sounds real good based on where we were, uh, and it's just we got a long way to go, so thank maybe, you all. Maybe a little less good if you're the Coast Guard side, but getting better here. All right. Um, you know, the, the th theme of today's, or West 2020, is are we ready to confront great power competition? And this afternoon, we have a panel that asks the question, are we ready to fight and win in a fully contested zone? How would you answer that question? I know it's a, a huge question, and we could probably spend an hour just on that, but for the audience, how confident or how comfortable are you where we stand right now vis-a-vis -vis our great power competitors? Why don't we start with the CNO? I think it depends on the fight, but, um, but uh, I feel pretty good. Um, actually, I feel very good when I think about the synergy across all domains, right? And so it's not just singularly any one service in terms of what we're bringing to the fight. Um, and the other thing that we've taken a look at is that uh, these are global fights, and so we intend to fight them trans-regionally as well. And so we would come at an adversary across many vectors, across all domains. Um, 
And so from that perspective, in terms of uh, exercises that I've observed in war games that I've participated in, I feel pretty good about our position. Commander Berger? We are ready. Uh, but I think we're also, not but, we are relearning what uh, great power competition is over the long haul, where two or three can, um, great powers are pacing off of each other. But you could have, a, in other words, the answer to your question might be uh, X this afternoon, but both are moving. So it's a question you have to ask all the time because they're making development, they're making changes to try to stay in front of us. We are doing the same. So are we ready for them? Is uh, now becomes a temporal question. In other words, this afternoon, six months from now, two years from now, it's, if either one stays static, uh, it goes out of balance. So we, we, this is something we're going to have to press hard on continuously. As long as, long as we have pacing threats, you, you can't lay off. And Commandant, since you took over, you've made uh, improving readiness in the Coast Guard your top priority. And in your most recent State of the uh, Coast Guard address, you started to outline some of the means in which you're getting after improving readiness. Do you want to cover some of those for us this morning? Yeah, let me maybe put in the context of the last question. I think when you think about the, the national defense strategy, our contributions are really below that level of armed conflict. I think we bring a lot to the fight on that continuum from cooperation to competition. Um, we've sent a couple heel-to-toe rotations of national security cutters out to the Seventh Fleet, and I think from, from the standpoint, are we ready? We're ready to contribute more to that fight, you know, solving this readiness conversation. That's important. I left about 600, 550, 600 cutter days on the table last year because of what we call Forex ONS operations support dollars that could be in the fight. I would like to continue to support the CNO and the combatant commanders to the extent they want. I think we bring, you know, when Joe Langell, the National Guard uh, Bureau Chief, came through the Pacific here, we went down to Antarctica recently, he came through the Pacific Island Nations. He says, Carl, everyone ran up to me and says, hey, great to see you, General, but we want to see more Coast Guard here. I think we bring that human to human interaction in places along that pathway from Hawaii to Asia. I talk to the ASEAN nations and you talk to the five big maritime partners there. I think they see a law enforcement problem set out there. I think the Coast Guard can bring some of that things to the fight. So for us, it's the readiness conversation is really about being able to press in there, bringing that human to human interaction that along that continuum below the level of armed conflict. I want to make sure we're able to push things in the fight. It's our patrol boats on the Arabian Gulf. So I think we're getting better, but I think there's a cost to those things, Bob. And that's what, as we talk readiness, it's our people, it's our domestic missions, it's our families, then it's that ability to contribute to the, uh, the national defense here and the bigger conversation about the national defense strategy. Thanks. You know, some people like to watch uh, the World Series and the Super Bowl. I like to watch congressional testimony. <laughs> Uh, and last week, I would have to say that it, it was a remarkable set of testimony. And CNO, last week, Secretary Esper claimed that the optimized fleet response plan hasn't worked for years, so why should we expect it to work in the future? And therefore, essentially what he said is, I don't trust the, the planning. Um, I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond. Yeah. because I thought it was quite remarkable. Yeah, I don't necessarily agree with the Secretary's assessment. I say that with all due respect, uh, but we have meet and projecting to the future continue to meet every commitment, uh, every deployment um, that we've been directed, been directed to do. The fleet response plan itself, the optimized fleet response plan is supposed to do four things. So the first thing it's supposed to do is rotate the force, right? And that force is a SECDEF directed force to provide immediate response and, and, set, and set the globe. The second thing it's supposed to do is be able to surge the force in terms of crisis. And so we have forces in sustainment, uh, many that are either working up for deployment or just back from deployment, that are ready for a period of about 14 months to surge if, if required. And we've called in those surge forces a lot. The third thing that the, that the, that the construct allows you to do is to, uh, maintain and modernize the force so it remains operationally relevant. Uh, and the last thing it does is it gives you the ability to reset the force if you do have to surge for crisis. So we learned a lot, you know, in previous models that, I, that go back to 1992 when we had the interdeployment training cycle and then we had the fleet response plan and we weren't necessarily developing a surge force. Uh, I talked a little about uh, in an earlier question, in an earlier question about I commented on the op-tempo that we had with double pumping carriers, nine to 11 month deployments. So the OFRP has also given 
uh, a degree of stability for our sailors. When I came into the job, I directed uh, U.S. Fleet Forces Command and uh, the commanders of Pacific Fleet to, to conduct an assessment of OFRP uh, because it's been five or six years since we put it into place. And I had questions myself coming out of the Joint Staff on plans that I had uh, observed that at, at a minimum I thought we were going to need, uh, we were going to have to buy more surge. Uh, Secretary Esper uh, asked for a separate independent assessment of OFRP. That's ongoing. I think uh, we have another meeting with him this week with this outside agency that's going to present their findings. And the Navy's been very much a part of, uh, of working, uh, working on that. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, what we have to do is understand what the Secretary of Defense really wants with respect to either increased uh, presence today or increased surge, or a combination of both of those. And the question is, so in an OFRP cycle of 36 months, and only about, so there's 52 percent of the force that's in that 36-month model, right, that 36-month contract construct, SSNs, SSBNs, uh, your FD and F forces, your military seal of forces are not in a 36-month cycle. But it's taken a look at you know, the maintenance phase, and we're doing a lot to improve in the maintenance phase, the training phase. And so if I, I take both of those together, nominally they're about 14 or 15 months, and then the remainder of that, uh, of, of the OFRP, uh, the remaining 21 to 22 months, that's for employability. And so right now we do a seven-month deployment, and then the, the strike group or the ARG spends 14 months in surge. If we want to, if we want to change how we deploy in that, within that 22 months, we can take a look at that. We can take a look at the cost of that, right? And not to drag this out too long, but uh, but the paradigm has completely changed with the NDS in terms of how we identify what we need in terms of capacity-ready forces. And so, before uh, Secretary Mattis signed out the NDS, it was a demand-driven model based on what the COCOMs wanted and they were never satisfied because you just didn't have enough to go around. Now it's a top-down driven model. So the Secretary of Defense says you will have this many forces of these types ready to go in zero to 10 days. So on any given day, the Navy has 90 to 105 ships deployed. So those ships, those players are on the field. The Secretary then has his, his, his responsibility is to prioritize how you want to use those forces. It takes into account uh, the Navy's force generation model uh, and the fact that we're recovering from readiness as we already talked about. So all that is factored in along with globally integrated base plans and stressing O plans to figure what we need out there today to set the globe and then what you need to, what you need to surge. A long answer to your question and, and I'm sure that I'll get a follow up from the audience, but, uh, but the bottom line is OFRP is meeting the mark. We are digging into the maintenance side, and I can talk about that later. Uh, and on the training side, we're doing very, very well. Thank you. I want to shift more to the capabilities now. And also last week, the size of the fleet, how fast you get there, how much it costs, was very much kind of central in Congress in all of the testimonies. So uh, I'd like to ask both UCNO and Commandant, where are we in this debate? I mean, do we have a number? Are we shooting towards a number? Secretary, Acting Secretary Modley said we need another 120 to 130 billion over the next 10 years if we were to try to hit the 355. Uh, sometimes unmanned or in, sometimes unmanned or out. Can you give us a sense on where that debate is right now and where it might be heading? I want to start. So, the, uh, when the Commandant and I both came in office, we uh, shook hands and agreed to do an integrated force structure assessment. So we hadn't done one, the Navy hadn't done one since 2016, and that fed the, uh, actually, that was the baseline for uh, the NDAA, the law which established 355 numbers, the law of the land for ships. Um, and so we decided not to do a coordinated assessment, but an integrated assessment. And so our staffs, worked together. We did uh, modeling and simulation down at McCidic. We did it within the Pentagon. 
but we uh, not only took into account distributed maritime operations conceptually on the Navy side and the fleet side, and uh, 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 expeditionary advanced basing operations on the Marine Corps side, but we integrated those in a very challenging scenario. And that scenario was a scenario that was endorsed by the Joint Staff. So we felt like we were using a scenario that was recognized within the Pentagon that both OSD CAPE and the Joint Staff supported, and they were, we, we were coming at it in an integrated fashion. One of the things we changed in this assessment is we took a look at, uh, for the first time, non-programmer record. So we took a look at unmanned, but because it's conceptual, there were a lot of caveats and assumptions. Um, and, uh, uh, and so when we came up with our final analysis, it came up with a discrete number of ships, which was north of 355, and then separately unmanned, uh, because again, they're conceptual. But another really important piece of this integrated force structure assessment is that we don't intend to let it sit in the shelf for three years. And so we intend to, for this assessment to be updated every year by now a larger volume of exercises, experimentation, war game and analysis and studies that we're doing so that it informs every budget cycle. So that that North Star and the mix, which is critically important, is gonna change. And what we're really focused on, I think if I could speak for the Commandant for a second, isn't necessarily the numbers of platforms, but it's, it's the capabilities that the Navy brings to the fight. And so we're part of a joint team, right? And we're not gonna win unless we fight as a joint team. So what unique naval capabilities do we bring to the fight? Think integrated uh, air wing on an aircraft carrier. Think about what submarines bring to the fight or a multi-mission DDG that does ASW and has long range uh, inland strike capabilities and those types of things. So that in with other joint capabilities helps determine what we bring to the fight that is then gonna translate into platforms and a mix of platforms over time. Coming up. Uh, just to I extend that beyond the scenario of what it takes to win that, ki that kind of a fight. I think the learning that we're all going through is in a more macro sense to accomplish what the national defense strategy tells us, what does it take to deter elsewhere in the world right. in addition to the fight that you're in. So the number, you know, how many or what type of ship do we need has to factor in not only what it takes to win in any given scenario, but concurrently with that, to deter something bad from happening around the rest of the world. And I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't have stated any better. Part of the magic of how do you deter and how do you win in a conflict is how you're going to fight, which is changing. It's changing. And it ties back to the previous question on OFRP, right? So we are challenging the assumptions in, in OFRP because we need a construct to produce the, both, both the ready forces today and the surge forces we need in the bench in order to meet, as the Commandant said, not only the fight you're in, but how do you set the globe to deter an opportunistic uh, peer competitor as well and still meet those five national defense strategy uh, mission areas to deter conventionally and strategically and respond to threats assure allies and partners and so on. Commandant Schultz, I'm not sure how it works. Uh, you know, there isn't, I've never heard like a 355 number for the Coast Guard, some analogy. Right. I've heard, you know, you want to shoot for 25 offshore patrol cutters and 58 uh, Sentinel class uh, patrol boats. Um, I think your program of record for the national security cutter is still eight, but Congress continues to uh, give you a new one each year, which is, you know, kind of totally cool. Um, how do you, think of in terms of the overall capabilities needed in the Coast Guard? Sure, and it's interesting. I, I you know, follow with keen interest the, the conversations about the, the number for the Navy. I spoke recently at Surface Naval Association, sort of talked maybe the conversation, a different lens to look through, it might be a conversation about a national fleet. You know, we're, I was at the, in Pascagoula on Saturday, commissioned the ninth national security card. It's a good story there. That was a program, a record of eight ships. We've got stable Coast Guard requirements. We know the ship we need. We've got a very capable shipbuilder. We had Senator Roger Wicker and Congressman Steve Palazzo there. We got informed members of Congress that see the value those ships are delivering to the nation every day. So we're, you know, that was the ninth. We've got two ships on, on budget, the 10th and 11th. There's ongoing conversation about whether it's gonna be a 12th or not. You know, for me, it's not a specific number, but it's those national security cutters on the high end. Those are our flagships, global deployers, skiff enabled. Um, again, 
you know, below the level armed conflict, they got some self-defense capabilities, but it's not, it's not missile equipped, so it's, there's limited applications. 25 offshore patrol cutters, that's gonna be a 360 foot ship. Similar capabilities, not quite the speed or air search radar, but that's a global deployer. And I, I look at what are those 36, 36 plus ships contribute to the fight where we just awarded the contract back in April last year for a polar security cutter. That's gonna be a roughly 460 foot ship to reach the high latitudes on both ends of the world. And we're, we just got um, you know, production underway. We're doing detailed design, fill, first still on that first ship, cut steel next year. The 21 budget includes funding for production on number two. So I think the conversation's hopefully building to three. We're having a conversation about what medium icebreaker. So I, I don't have a number in mind, Bob, but it's a, it's a amount of capability. I look at it from effect. What effect is the Coast Guard trying to have? And then do we build the fleet towards that effect? We're also looking to step out on, you know, some number around three dozen waterways commerce cutters, supply the nation's waters, enable the 45,000 federal aids and navigation. We're building out domestic program, a record of 58 fast response cutters. We took the acceptance on the 37th. We're sending six over to support Mike's fifth fleet over there on the, on the Arabian Gulf here on the maritime security mission. So there's not a specific number. It's really how much capability the Coast Guard needs to do our organic Coast Guard missions and then contribute to the, uh, to the joint force. I, I would just add though, the trend clearly, uh, we're gonna need more unmanned. We're gonna need more smaller, lower signature capable ships that can fight dispersed. We know the trend lines are really, are really clear. Mm -hmm. I want to pull on this integration string because both of you uh, brought it up and I want to hit you last coming up because uh, there's a very interesting article written by a Marine infantryman yeah. about uh, how the uh, Coast Guard might integrate. But in your initial Frago uh, CNO, in an eight page document, you mentioned integration seven times. Mm. Uh, if anything, Commandant, in your uh, Commandant's planning guidance, I mean, you pushed integration even further. Um, can you give the audience a sense, you know, where is this headed? We, it's kind of ill-deformed, I mean, other than the fact that we want to integrate. I think everybody thinks that's a great idea. Uh, but both of you arrived before you could really affect the 21 budget, so mm -hmm. uh, now the kind of, there's a canvas open for you. So can you kind of paint the canvas for the audience on where you think this integration is going to go? I'll start if you want. Uh. For me, it goes back uh, to 2016 to 2018 timeframe, driven by uh, a series of war games and exercises when I was in Hawaii with uh, Not So Swift and Shags O'Shaughnessy, Admiral Harris. Each war game, or at least it could have been before I got there, but every single war game for those two years, the conclusion was, if you're going to um, maintain an advantage over uh, a nation like China, then you're going to have to operate in a different way than you are right now. And the different way, in other words, the different <laughs> way is integration. It, it is the asymmetric advantage that the U.S. has. The ability to operate, one, combined arms, but two, as an expeditionary naval force, no one else is close. So push the limits on that, that maintain that margin of advantage that you have. So it wasn't it wasn't out of emotion. It was driven purely by logic. The results are the same every time. Keep fighting the same with the same war fighting concept and the same capabilities. The outcome is going to be the same. We have to change. So the integration, to me, driven by the tactical to operational end. That's where that has to drive it back, back up to the top. And so, you know, what we see in the integrated force structure assessment new ships that reflect more integration? Or are there any other things that would be concrete that people could say, oh, wow, this is really happening? When that uh, force structure assessment is finally released, you will see uh, discrete ships that we'll bring, we're bringing online. Uh, they're smaller amphibs in terms of and they're connectors, really, to, to, to move, uh, to take advantage of the mobility uh, of the Fleet Marine Force and move them to places where they can uh, where they can bring effects of beer, both kinetic and non-kinetic, to uh, help us with both sea control and sea denial. Cool. Now, Commandant, I mentioned an article it was written by a Marine infantry officer who is an exchange officer in Colombia, and the title of the article was "Integrate with the Marines." Dot dot dot. And who else? And uh, 
I almost thought he was a former Coast Guardsman because he basically said integrating the Coast Guard better into the great power competition model with both the Navy and the Marines uh, would be a virtuous thing. Uh, and so have you had the opportunity to talk more? Is there, are there Coast Guard, Navy, Marine Corps talks going on how we might be able to push this also? Yeah, that, that Marine, I think, wrote two very insightful articles. I had a chance to see them both, Bob. And I think uh, I really appreciate his perspective. You'd almost think the commandant wrote that and put the Marine Corps commander or colonel's name on there. But um, I think at the end of the day, Mike's team, Dave's team, my team, we're together. You know, we're sort of looking back to the 21st century cooperative strategy from 2015. Our teams are working. It, it's a little ahead of that to talk about that much here. But I look forward to that. I saw the CNOs, you know, Frago read it with great interest. And uh, clearly, you know, when the Coast Guard sits outside of the Department of Defense, it's a little different for the CNO to sort of write tasking in there. But I think with this, this document we're working on, the, you know, I have the privilege not being by law a member of the Joint Chiefs, but I sit at the pleasure of the chairman and the SECDEF at the table. I think we're having those conversations. So I absolutely think that Marine's thinking is, is where we're heading a little bit, that integrated solutions that I hope will involve the Coast Guard. And again, it's, it's you know, you think about the complexity of the problem sets, you think about the national defense strategy and competing powers, it is a continuum. And you know, when the CNO can put the shooters in places where you need shooters and possibly a national security cutter could scratch an itch, sanctions enforcement, other type work, capacity building, why wouldn't we want to be part of that conversation? So I think we're, we're in a good spot, heading to a better spot. I look very, very much look forward to sort of just tightening up and, and solidifying this and sort of rolling out this new, uh, this new thinking here for the uh, nation's naval forces, maritime security forces, however we decide to sort of banner that. I think it's an exciting time, it's an important time in this national defense strategy, actioning that. There's, there's more work there for, for all of us, for any of us. I think the collaboration, the cooperation is the, is the magic there. I think it's good, good that he wrote. I, I'm pretty sure when I was at that rank, I'd never worked with the Coast right. Guard, didn't think of, I don't know about you, but it wasn't even, I don't, I don't remember the first time I worked with the Coast Guard, but it wasn't at that rank. The fact that it's being thought about, talked about, Good, and, good. and this year, Bob, just on that note, we're somewhat, some of the audience here, we're up in Alaska. I went up with the former secretary for yeah. the Arctic mm -hmm. Expeditionary Capabilities Exercise. Anyway, Coast Guard C-130s, we had Coast Guard Maritime Security Response Units around the naval combatants that were in there doing the exercise. There was fuel transfers. There's a P-8 up there. I think there's absolutely, i say, beyond niche capabilities that we can bring to that fight. So I, I'm really excited about this, this enhanced integration here that I think all the sea services are, are about getting after. Just one more ad. Uh, so the commandant alluded to it, but uh, and we haven't talked about this publicly before, but our staffs are working together on a tri-service maritime strategy that uh, should be presented to us by the summer. And so we are trying to bring things together from a top-down perspective in a, in a more integrated way. Yeah, great. I want to ask each of you a, a detailed question. I'll pose two of them to each of you. Uh, so I'll just go around one and then I'll go around uh, another time. Commandant, uh, in 21, you drop uh, Marine Corps in strength by 2,000, and you testified last week that uh, 22 and 23, you might see more. Um, so obviously, you're making these to free up headroom to pursue other capabilities. Can you give us a sense on the type of capabilities you're going to go after? Historically, like, like you know, we have grown and contracted the Marine Corps over, over our history when we needed to. Um, this is the time when we have to get smaller to get better. If we're going to be an integrated part, if we're going to actually directly contribute to sea control, sea denial, then we got to have capabilities we don't have right now. We got to hold at risk uh, naval platforms, an, a body of water, a piece of littoral terrain, and those are capabilities we don't have right now, but we need to get. So, Rather than hold on to a larger force structure um, and not be able to make the change, not be able to <coughs> pivot in the direction we got to go, we're making a conscious decision to go there. So we will contract some. I don't know how far, but the end result will be a much more capable Marine Corps that's it's, uh, maintains the asymmetric, the advantage that we have to have in a unique way. So, you know, uh, Ford aircraft carrier elevators uh, have been in the news a lot. Uh, can you bring us up to speed, and uh, how is the Ford doing overall? 
Yeah, so uh, on the elevators, we've doubled the number of, el of operational elevators. We'll certify another in here in another month or so, two more this summer. Let me talk about Ford uh, for just a second. I am very bullish on that carrier and the capability it brings not only to the fleet but to the nation. So we've got two uh, nuclear power plants that are certified for deployment. Um, ship was out at, ship will spend 50% uh, of the next year at sea. The only ships we have with that kind of op tempo are probably the rota-based DDGs. Um, her flight deck's been, been certified for all type model series aircraft that are, gonna, that are gonna deploy with her in her first deployment. Her flight deck will be certified by the end of this month. She'll be operational at the end of the month and she will be the East Coast carrier for carrier quals for the next year. Last month she was out for a, a 20 day period, logged some 7,000 miles. They were chasing the highest seas they could find in order to test the elevators. We're, we're, we're bringing uh, shipyard workers to sea with us. We have streamlined the, the work that we need to do, the phasing that we need to do over the next year so that we're trying to sustain momentum between import and at sea periods. So that we bring the ship uh, about a year from now, uh, next April, we begin to enter a four month shock trial period. And then after that, uh, we're gonna see what we can do with her operationally for an extended period of time. The dual band radar is performing very well. The, the story about the elevators is that, uh, you know, the, the, the punchline is that the elevators are, are broken. The elevators are not fully constructed. They're not built. And so we have four fully, fully built right now. We'll have seven by the end of the summer and the remaining four will finish in, in 2021. But the path to those has really been, been good over the past several months. We feel like we have figured out what the main limiting factors have and are moving pretty steadily to stay on schedule with delivering those elevators. Commandant Schultz, you mentioned uh, the polar cutters. Um, this has been something that was talked about when I was the undersecretary back in 2009, and it just never seemed to go anywhere. Um, is that program now going to be funded, and are we going to have capabilities for the high end, uh, north and the south? Yeah, there's, there's absolutely a good news story. I think if you think about the purpose of this conference, and we're thinking about the world through the lens of the national defense strategy, both China and Russia, who are really the competing global powers at the center of the strategy, have made the Arctic a priority. You know, one is a legitimate Arctic nation and the other is a self-declared near Arctic state. But, you know, China's operating up off the Alaskan Arctic. They're keenly interested in, in the availability of natural resources, rare, you know, minerals on the ocean's floor, a third of the untapped LNG in the world. Um, they're paying attention to what we're doing as we cite fifth generation fighters up there in the state of Alaska. And there's that piece. There's Russia who looks at a ship out of Shanghai if you provide ice breaking service across the northern sea route, you can knock two weeks off that transit. So they see the Arctic as a, an economic generator. I mean, today about 23, 24% of their GDP is derived from Arctic activity. So through the context of the national defense strategy, the Arctic regions are absolutely important. To answer your question, the, you know, we did, we got funding in, 29, in 2020 in the spring, uh, excuse me, 2019 in the spring for that first polar security cutter, the detailed design and construction contract. So that's a good, you know, a good start to that. But we're chasing, we're chasing China. China will have more ice breaking capability as a self-declared near Arctic state than the United States government by 2025. You know, they have a ship they got from the Ukrainians, a Snow Dragon 1. They built the second Snow Dragon 2 last year in China. They're building a heavy breaker. You know, Russia, you hear the number 50 icebreakers. They've got about four to eight really capable nuclear breakers. They're building more nukes. They're building LNG breakers. I mean, they are, they are doubling down in the Arctic. So we're having a conversation with the Congress within the administration about more breakers. That's great. We spent about a decade sort of conditioning the space about the importance. I think it was this pivot to this global competing powers that really pushed the conversation over over the edge here a little bit to start recognizing we are playing catch up ball. So I talk about a 631 strategy. We need minimum of six icebreakers. Three of them need to be these heavy polar security cutters. We're having a conversation about requirements builds for what a medium breaker might look like. And you know, today the conversation is the East South China Sea from a freedom of navigation, but think about a contested Northern Sea route. What capabilities are gonna go up there and operate there? It's probably something that 
looks and operates like a polar security cutter. The conversation may be well beyond three of those. But I think the good news is we're actioning that. We're off to the races. Late 23, 24, the first polar security cutter will, will splash and uh, we'll put it to work. That first ship's probably going to spend most of her time down in Antarctica breaking out uh, McMurdo Station. I was down there recently and uh, visited our 44-year-old icebreaker, which before we take her out of service will be our 50-year-old polar icebreaker, Polar Star. She's the world's most uh, you know, capable, mm -hmm. 75,000 horsepower non-nuclear breaker, but she's on life support, Bob. So this is a good thing for the nation, but we're clearly playing catch-up ball. Cool. Commandant, you, have mentioned, you mentioned unmanned systems uh, just a few minutes ago, and uh, kind of implicit in your planning guidance, and I think you said there's going to be a large number of human machine special purpose MAGTAFs out there, my word, not yours, um, uh, that can be more easily inserted from possibly longer range and really be able to do things differently in the past. Uh, do you want to talk about that? We're, I'd like to get to the audience here soon, so I'd like to ask that the uh, answers be as concise as you can. In the range from totally unmanned, which isn't, of course, totally unmanned, to fully manned, and the whole spectrum in between, we have to exploit it. Again, not because we love science, but because it allows you to cover a bigger frontage. It allows you to operate over a greater span of space than if you're uh, exclu exclusively just manned. The life-saving part of it clearly important, uh, but from a warfighting perspective, it allows you to operate on a persistent basis over a much larger frontage. So we got to push hard now. The competitors are pushing hard now. We have to push hard now. The, probably the space we got to learn the most about is the teaming aspect that you talked about. How, are, how is man and machine actually going to work together to produce like one plus one equals something more like four or five? You know? We have to move fast. CNO, uh, in the 21 budget, uh, the recommendation is to decommission the first four LCSs. Mm -hmm. um, is there a story behind this move? Or does it reflect uh, growing Navy dissatisfaction with the ships? Uh, they're not going to be as important in the future fleet as once thought. Uh, can you give us a little sense on what your thoughts are there? Yeah, thanks for the question. So let me take the second piece of it first. So we're going to have a fleet of 31 uh, littoral combat ships. And so the question is, what are we going to do with those ships? We think we're in a good place right now with respect to the organization on both coasts. We're going to have 14 in the East Coast, 17 on the West Coast. We think that we've done a good job with crewing. Uh, we have, we're, we're testing the balloon goal. We're testing it. We're, we're deploying it this year. Um, we think we've got the organization down, and we've invested a lot in training. So we feel like, foundationally, we're in a much better place than we've been. In terms of mission modules, we're delivering the surface mission module, we're delivering the, uh, the naval strike missile now that gives us an over-the-horizon cruise missile capability. We're do the final testing on the, on the ASW modules on both variants this year. They'll make their maiden deployment in 22, and right after that, uh, the mine uh, countermeasures uh, capability will, uh, will deploy as well. So right now we're deploying five of those ships this year. Uh, we've got two of them down in the Southcom AOR, two of them in Indo-PACOM, a fifth coming out here to deploy. We're using the blue and gold construct. We've successfully fired a uh, naval strike missile off of Gabriel Giffords. Um, we have done a good job down in Southcom in particular and the sustainability piece using, uh, using uh, Gitmo as kind of our hub. Uh, we will double, and within a couple of years, we'll double the amount of deployed LCSs simultaneously. So if I get to one, to f so we need to use those ships. We need to get serious about using those ships. We have thousands of sailors that are well-trained and excited about those ships. We need to get the capability on them so they're operationally relevant, and that's what we're focused on. And I think uh, testimony to that is we're delivering those modules and, and deploying those ships and the COCOMs want more of them. Uh, we'll follow up uh, at, at, the, at the heels of these Southcom and Indo-PACOM deployments with CENTCOM and UCOM uh, right afterwards. With the first four, so we made a decision a number of years ago in order to give capability to LCS 5 and beyond, and particularly the block buys we did uh, in 2015, we decided we needed to do much more testing and use those first four hulls so that we better understand 
what were the issues with respect to home maintenance and engineering that kept on plaguing us, right, uh, and kept us from getting those ships to sea? What do we need to do in terms of upgrades, uh, in terms of power generation, in terms of other warfighting uh, capabilities, whether it was electronic warfare or C4I or the gunfire control system? So we use those first hulls to test, and we put no money into upgrading them like the rest of the fleet. So in order, to, in order to put them in the same par as the rest of the LCS class, uh, it would cost about another $2 billion over the fit-up. So that was a tough decision to make on whether we wanted to put that money towards those existing LCSs or retire them, move on with the rest of the class, and then take that $2 billion and put it in the SCN account for, for different capability. The bottom line, Bob, is those first four ships are not bringing lethality to the fight. They're not bringing capa capability to the fight, and I just didn't see the return on investment to do that. Thanks. Yep. Commodore Schultz, uh, we know the basic outlines, national security cutter, offshore patrol cutter, fast response cutter, um, the, Arctic, uh, the Arctic cutters. What is the next big capability that you think the Coast Guard needs to bring in uh, to improve its overall capabilities in our national defense strategy? Yeah, in terms of capabilities, Bob, I mean, it's, it, I talked about the cutters, I won't rehash that, but I think aviation-wise, we're, we're watching future vertical lift. Um, we're flying a fleet of 98 Dolphin aerospatial Dolphin helicopters that are beyond any hours anybody's flying, and we gotta pay attention to that. It's a composite aircraft. We'll be flying them north of 30,000 hours. Our MH-60s, Skorsky Birds, um, we need to probably drive down that fleet of 98 Dolphins and take our fleet of 45, 46 MH-60s and drive that up as we sort of look down the road on what our DOD colleagues are doing with future vertical lift. I think that's important. We're missionizing our C-27s. We got uh, 14 C-27Js in a swap with um, the U.S. Air Force and the fire service with some old H models. And uh, we're putting the Minotaur platform on board. So we'll have commonality with our CBP Air Marine colleagues within DHS with our, with our Navy and uh, other colleagues, defense colleagues. That's a good story there. And then we're bringing on board uh, C-130Js. We've got the 17th came in the budget last year. We're building out to a program of 22. So I think it's continuing the momentum on the, on the surface capabilities. It's pressing in on the air capabilities. Keenly, the readiness thing for me, though, really, Bob, it's the people. It's in a competitive environment where less than a third of Americans, you know, 28, 29 percent, are eligible to serve. I got to go find about 3,700 every year. My DOD brethren are bringing in about 1,000 every couple of days. So it's really, you know, having those, um, you know, we get the same entitlement, the same pay. But things like tuition assistance, I fund that at 50% because I'm constrained on the ONS top line. It's training, it's professional development. That's where we got to really, as we drive up our readiness and get on a good trajectory, I think we remain a more competitive employer. Thank you. I'm going to be shifting over to questions from the audience. So those who want to pose a question, you can head up to the uh, microphone. But I want to ask the CNO one other question. I read that- The bonus question. This is a bonus question. <laughs> I read that uh, one of our P-8s was lased by a Chinese ship. Uh, I wanted to know, is it true? What actions have we taken with the Chinese? And do we have the protective gear for our pilots who are operating in the Western Pacific against these kind of attacks? It happened. It's the first time we saw it happen from that type of uh, PLAN ship. Uh, we do have protective gear on board for the uh, uh, for, for our pilots, and importantly, they're also trained to deal with it. But it is the fir I can't confirm it is the first time we saw it. Uh, we have uh, the U.S. government's demarche the Chinese. Thank you. All right, who's first? Hi, Megan Eckstein with USNI News. Uh, thank you all very much for being here. Um, Admiral Gilday and General Berger, you both spoke about the need to have the Naval Integrated Force be ready and have a capable, credible surge force. Um, from the civilian leadership, we've heard a lot about growing capacity, whether it's uh, Secretary Esper committing to 355 or Secretary Modley even talking about 390. So I wonder if there is a discrepancy maybe between uniformed and civilian leadership or kind of how you can um, maybe address the readiness versus uh, capacity issue. I'll start off. I think there's no disagreement at all that any growth in the military has to uh, has to factor in readiness. We're not going towards a hollow force. Between the military and civilian side, uh, 
there may have been some uh, different views on that in the past, but I, I, it's pretty rare. If you're going to add one more of anything, it's got to be ready. So no one is headed towards a hollow, large force at all, which is why I think uh, the, the CNO mentioned any if we grow, if we're allowed to grow, you know, above the force level that we have right now, it's got to come with the resources that sustain that over time, the people, the training, the maintenance, the whole package. Yeah, I think if you took a look, if you take a look at analysis that's done, whether it's inside the Pentagon or outside, uh, every analysis has been consistent uh, in numbers north of 355. And so what the Secretary of Defense has said he wants to do is take the existing force structure assessment, which, which in its essence is a requirements document that both uh, yeah. the Commandant and I sign out, and he wants to uh, run that through a series of war games, deeper studies, bring in uh, outside entities to take a look, which we welcome. And so that's why uh, earlier I talked more about uh, capabilities that will translate into platforms than I did specific numbers. You can chase those numbers all day long, and I'm not sure it's very uh, productive or satisfying. Just, just one le other thought that comes to mind. We're, there's also an evolution of thinking and readiness itself. Yeah. It's not just the availability of something. It's ready to do something specific. It's ready at a certain time. So the what unit of measure do we use for readiness? So. Our readiness tools that we've had for decades, we have to evolve them as well, if that makes sense to you. A much more refined view of what does ready mean. Thank you very much. Good morning, CNO Commandant. I just want Miner from Strategic Command. My question is for you, CNO. Whether it's 310 ships or 355 ships, how do we plan to recruit and retain to man those vessels? Uh, where are we facing many issues at sea of our existing force? And we're seeing drawdowns and in incentives like TA and reenlistment bonuses. How do I help you get our recruiting and our retention above the 74, 78% into the higher 80s to try to man these ships that we've been talking about building all morning? Yeah, so uh, I take a little bit more positive outlook. So the 78% retention is above our, is, is above our benchmark. Uh, tuition assistance, we did see a dip in that in, um, uh, in 2019, but I am committed to fully funding it. And we have funded so many other uh, personnel-related incentive programs, including, uh, in including uh, if I go all the way left to families where readiness really begins, and taking a look at what we're doing with child care in terms of buying back 5,000 child care seats this year, in terms of buying more, uh, in terms of paying for more child care providers. If you take a look at what we've done with uh, My Navy HR in terms of the apps that we've put out there for sailors to use in terms of the detailing marketplace, the ability to do a PCS move, to, uh, to, to um, set up the PCS move online, to do all of your, uh, your travel claims using the app, uh, to have an app that doesn't require a CAC that you can use from your phone. For your family to set up childcare, for your family to set up housing off of those same apps. Uh, in terms of uh, other things that we've done, so we brought back meritorious promotions, right? And so we've gone from 5% when we initiated a couple of years ago to 20% now, where commanders actually get to say, these are the sailors that I think that merit promotion. We've provided incentives in terms of advancements for those tough positions at sea that we're trying to attract really able, willing, and qualified E5s and E6s to get promoted to E6 and E7 based on taking those tough assignments if they, if they qualify for them. And then, and then in terms of the frustrating chase against closing gaps at sea, so the budget in 21 pays for an additional 7,000 sailors. And so what we are trying to do, what, what we're trying to do is quality of life, quality of work, to help retain you, the sailors around you, and importantly, their families. I hope that answers your question in terms of some of our focus, but those programs, those transformative programs in HR, we have tried to fully fund those as best we can. Thanks for asking that question, uh, because we talked readiness and capabilities. Yeah. Didn't really get the personnel, so Commandant Schultz, I'd like to 
and uh, bring it to the commandant, allow each of you to... Uh, sure, I, I would echo the CNO. It's competitive, and uh, young people have many choices. We've done some things in terms of, you know, across our workforce. We have a workforce of 15% uh, women in an environment north, across America where 50% women are staffing the workforce. We're trying to bring more women to the organization. We have some success stories there. The United States Coast Guard Academy graduating class of 20... 20 here is going to be about, it's about 40% women. And the entire population academy is 40%. That's a good news story, but we've got to bring more women to race. We're focused on diversity and inclusion. We've got to have a Coast Guard that looks more like the nation we serve. The touch points from a recruiting standpoint, they'll go bring an African-American female on board, a Hispanic male, uh, a woman. They're almost two to three to one in some cases. So we, we really need to get our recruiters in places we haven't been before. We need to grow our number of recruiters. We've done some things in terms of we have many geographically dispersed small units. If you're at a boat station on the Pacific Northwest Coast, there's 30 shipmates. A young female Coast Guard has been, wants, goes out and has her first or second child. You know, we have child care up to 84 days away care for second givers, but it's very a lot of pressure and stigma to take off for 84 days because your shipmates are carrying a lot of load here. We just come up with a program where we backfill that sailor with a reservist so they can go and they can make the family adjustments, they can settle things in. Child development centers, I have nine across the Coast Guard, eight or nine across the Coast Guard. So we're really working with Congress on subsidies. We can put our hand on that rheostat with the subsidy and help pay folks in high cost areas. We've had some success there. We're looking to continue to press that conversation. So it is a competitive environment. We're trying to do some, some different thinking. We're trying to have more, perm, you know, more permeability in the workforce. You think it's cyber ratings. Um, you know, we're training most of the cyber professionals here in North America in the armed services. How do we keep them in? I think we've got to think about permeability from active to reserve, reserve to private sector to back in. Mike's team has done some you know, innovative things. I think the gold ticket, the silver ticket, you can come back in and you don't have to play catch up on where you left the service. It's competitive for pilots. So we're trying to do some kind of busting our thinking of yesteryear and being a lot more forward thinking about human talent management. I call it the mission ready total workforce and we're really inside the Coast Guard lifelines changing our thinking there, Bob. Coming up. Are you on your second enlistment? I'm preparing to re-enlist for my third commandant. Yeah. Why'd you stay in? Because I love this uniform. Yeah. I think I think we need to pay attention to that. I, I'm not, everything that uh, my two shipmates said, I 100% agree with. But at the end of the day, I think you stayed in because you felt like you were making a difference and you liked the team that you're on, right? I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but at the end of the day, that's why we join an organization, that's why we stay. Am I making a difference? Do I, do I like this team? Our job is to make, the life on the team, better. All, all the things that they said so that it's not a choice between having a family or having a career. We have to do everything humanly possible to make, their, make that team better. And, but at the end of the day, the other half is still true. Are you making a difference? So if we're not making it possible for Coast Guardsmen or soldiers or Marines, if they don't feel like they're making a difference, we're going to lose them. We're going to lose them. Because they're not going to stay for money. They're not going to stay... For other, they, have to, they have to stay because they're making a difference, because what they do matters. What you do matters, right? You're protecting the nation. This is what we do. Thank you, Petty Officer. Thank you all. Next one. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Mallory Shelbourne with Inside Defense. Um, Admiral Gilday, you mentioned a new tri-service maritime strategy. I'm wondering if there's any additional details you can share on what that might look like and how the sea services um, will use that moving forward in conjunction with the national defense strategy. Yeah, so it'll be informed by the national defense strategy, but I can't provide any additional, additional details yet. The teams, are, the, the teams have been working on it for about two and a half, three months, but we haven't seen any of those results yet. And you said this summer you're expecting to complete it? We expect to see something in the summer based on that work. And when do you think the public might see something? Good question. Probably shortly thereafter. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, thank you for your time this morning. Lieutenant Commander Vantries, uh, VFA 192 Operations Officer. Uh, this question 
is uh, directed primarily at Admiral Gilday, um, and it relates directly to personnel, but certainly impacts long-term readiness. Several communities, including aviation, are facing significant shortages of officers and enlisted personnel during maintenance phase. What efforts have been made, if any, to better utilize the experience and capabilities of our reserve sailors to augment our active duty force, enabling more opportunity to train to and maintain an increasingly compact, complex tactical edge and improve quality of life during maintenance phase? Yeah, so um, the answer to uh, properly manning our ships is not uh, is not to bring reserves in to fill those gaps. We're looking at, you know, fully manning to, to the numbers that we're supposed to have uh, on our ships a full year out uh, for when they're gonna begin training. So this is well into the maintenance cycle. And so that's what we're cited on. And so how do we, uh, how do we change uh, the way we're rotating the force in order to make sure that we're properly filling all of those gaps? Some of those are just a question of quantity of sailors. And so again, I go back to a point that I made in the last question about putting more money to manpower so that we have sufficient amount of well-trained sailors to fill those positions. Thank Schultz, you. Kamala Berger, do either of you have, want to jump no, in on great. No, The only thing I'll add in that, and just from a reserve standpoint, not a maintenance standpoint, <clears throat> we're a reserve of about 7,000. At one point, we were authorized up to 10,000, never got above 8,100. We are doubling down on our, our Coast Guard Reserve. We've got to make more active duty members that leave the service for whatever reason. Maybe it's a change in life, a working spouse, elderly parent. Jumping into the reserves has got to be a preferred choice. And right now we're losing in that space. So we're doing some things first time in a more than a decade, tuition assistance for our reservists, not just our reservists and active orders, but tuition assistance for reservists. Hopefully that's a plus. And then, you know, someone leaves active duty, we put them at a port security unit. Six months later, they deploy for nine months. That's not the model where they want to be. So we're really taking a hard look inside the Coast Guard at our reserve programs. I think we got some exciting things coming out here in the coming months. Thank you, gentlemen. We have about five minutes, so uh, these will be the last two. Uh, Rick Easton, retired SWO. First of all, thanks very much for an excellent panel this morning. Uh, my question is for Admiral Gilday, uh, CNO, sir. Um, if I understand it, I think the 2021 shipbuilding plan or report to Congress was put on hold as the budget was submitted. Um, do you see that being submitted or w later, or will that be replaced by the force structure assessment? And then I know that uh, Secretary Modley talked about, and I probably have the words wrong, but burning midnight oil to find several billions of dollars. How is that initiative to help the reinvestment, particularly, I think, in the shipbuilding plan? But how is that initiative going, and, and, and where, where do you see that outcome? Yeah, thanks for the question. So on the shipbuilding plan, the question, it, the question really is whether it's going to be informed by the 2016 force structure assessment or whether you use the integrated force structure assessment that we just finished to fully inform it. And so, as the Secretary of Defense said, he wants to take a deeper look at the integrated force structure assessment and then make a decision on whether or not that informs the shipbuilding plan. And so, in due time, he's indicated that when he's satisfied, he'll release both. On the uh, uh, on the second piece about the Secretary's initiative to find money in the inside. So publicly, I, I've said that in order to grow the fleet, we need a higher top line. And so the first thing that we need to do responsibly, and we started doing this uh, after our budget submission uh, ended for 21, is to take a deeper look in the inside, basically put everything on the table, challenge our assumptions, and see what money we could shift. Not just, to, it won't just translate to the shipbuilding account, but it'll translate to the wholeness that goes along with that that we've been talking about this morning. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And this will be our last question. Good morning, gentlemen. Captain Sean Rushlow. I'm gonna take a little different uh, tack to global pure competition. So CSBA recently wrote a uh, two volume paper, uh, How to Win the War Without Fighting. Uh, and then March issue of USNI kind of focuses on building strategic partners. If you were to grade the whole of government response um, as compared to say the Cold War, what would that grade be? And then what elements of theater security cooperation would you build upon so we have that network of partners? Thank you. You want to start with the come up? So the grade, I, I didn't think about the grade. I think there's whole of government and the national defense strategy. I think there's tremendous opportunities there. I think we're focusing on, you know, the lethality piece, 
with the Coast Guard, we're figuring out how we fit under that, you know, that threshold below armed conflict. I would tell you there is tremendous opportunities. As I mentioned, my travels through the ASEAN region, they, they talk about Coast Guard's capacity building. I look at the Philippine Navy, it's 4,000 people. They got 11,900 person Coast Guard marching to 35,000. How do you go in and help build capacity there? I think there are tremendous whole of government partnership opportunities there that human to human. I mean, what are we trying to provide? We're trying to provide an alternative to coercive, antagonistic behaviors that challenge the rule-based order, um, the free and open seas. And I think that we got to think about that through a lens that, that's very broad, not just through the military lens. So I think there's tremendous opportunities. I think we can bring more in the fight. We did a 30-day operation in September last year with a 225-foot buoy tender and a patrol boat. And it's called Apa Ayinga, which means family. And we did around the Samoans, but we offered an alternative. This year we'll be back with a similar mothership, another buoy tender, a couple expeditionary capable patrol boats. We're fielding additional expeditionary patrol boats, fast response cutters in Guam. I think that that competition for ideals, Western ideals, I look at what the, the Kiwis, the Aussies are doing in the region. How do we lash up internationally and whole of government? I think there's some real opportunities to think about this. You know, A, we got to be ready for conflict, but really we hope to be operating and, and staying below conflict. It's that competition continuum from my perspective. Sino? I'd give us a solid B. I think it's really easy to be critical. I'm not saying that you are, but it's complex, right? It's not just complicated, it's complex to bring all those elements of government together. If I think, if you look across diplomatic, informational, military, economic, you can see whether you're thinking about Russia or China, you can think about things that we've been doing, whether it's been in the cyber domain with respect to the elections in terms of uh, stuff that we've done both offensively and, and, and defensively, uh, with respect to trade and the things we've done economically um, uh, in, the, in the diplomatic side as well. One important thing about the sea services, I think, uh, is because of our forward presence and because of, you know, navies meet all the time, not just in war but in peace as well, in Coast Guards, and we work very closely together. And if you take a look at those other elements of the dime, particularly diplomatic and economic, you can see where naval forces play in to reinforce the overall intent of the U.S. government uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Commander? It's really hard to compare two time frames that are like, and you're not exactly, they're different circumstances. But I, I think a lot of really bright people in the 50s, 60s, 70s who were focused on deterrence, conventional and strategic, and learned a lot of lessons and we would be wise to read some books that they wrote. I think today I would agree. I, to me, the biggest battle going on right now in great power competition, and I would say in Indo-PACOM, perhaps is in the information space. Mm -hmm. All the others are part of it, but it's an area that's hardest to define. Uh, there aren't any easy courses to take where you can become an information environment expert quickly. You can't. But that's where the battle is taking place. Last part. Uh, against a competitor and adversary like uh, PRC, where you vacate a space, they occupy. So the persistence part isn't just to be visible and uh, out there with your adversary or with your partners, with your allies, that's key. But void a space against that adversary, they'll be in it tomorrow. Convincing the same people in the neighborhood that they're a better partner than, than, you, than you are. We have a lot to learn in the information space. And it, this is, I'm convinced, decades-long sort of competition. It's not, it's not a week. It's not a month. It's long-term. So. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, uh, when I was the deputy secretary, I started using the term, and probably 90% of your, uh, who's ever heard me say the, uh, talk will hear this, but people ask me how I sleep at night. And I always respond, I sleep like a baby. I wake up crying every two hours. <laughs> and what I say over and over and over again is the reason why I always go back to sleep is because of our people. Our true asymmetric advantage against any competitor, especially competitors who are authoritarian regimes, is the fundamental initiative, uh, mission focus, and innovation 
of our young men and women who serve in all three of the sea services. And I think it's reflected right here in uh, these three fine gentlemen. Uh, I think we're blessed at this time to have people of this caliber uh, leading our services. And I'd ask you all to join me in thanking them for what they do and for their time this morning. Secretary Work, General Berger, Admiral Gilday, Admiral Schultz, on behalf of FCA International and Naval Institute, we thank you. We know your time is precious. I echo Secretary Work's comments. We're lucky to have you in these leadership positions at this very important time. For each of you, we have a book, Strategy, Context and Adaptation, Archidamus to Air Power, Naval Institute Press book with an FCA bookmark. It doesn't quite cover it but it's a token of our appreciation. And again, let's, let's thank our, our pres presenters. Thanks thank so you, much. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Bob. Ladies and gentlemen, we now move into a networking break in the exhibit hall, sponsored by Riverbed. We also hope you'll be able to join us for